Good morning and welcome to our latest webinar today, Video Consultation for Allied Health Professions and Neuropsychologists in Neurology. My name is Mark Bezik, I'm the National Lead for the Near Me Network and we've got an excellent lineup for you this morning. In terms of, um, as part of the framework for neurological care and support, the National Advisory Committee for Neurological Conditions is hosting this session to support AHPs and neuropsychologists when using video consultations. Before we get underway, a bit of housekeeping. The audience for yourselves, you'll all be on mute. Um, you can pause, it's a live event, so you can pause it and, and pick it up uh, a bit later on if you need to leave the room for something. You can also change the speed of the presentations and the speakers today. And you have some accessibility options, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, please get a, to a place where you can get good Wi-Fi. If you do lose us or lose sound or vision, please leave the session and, and come back in again or go to a place with better broadband <coughs> or connect to the network directly with an ethernet cable. We'd love to hear it from you um, in the Q&A section. You'll see that on the right hand side. I'll show you that in a minute. OK, the session will be recorded for you to view later on to share with colleagues who might not be able to attend today. And if you have any other topics to add in the chat, any suggestions or any use cases uh, for using video within neurology, then please let me know. Also in the chat, if you would like to put in where you're from and what profession you are, that'd be really helpful just to find out a bit more about our audience today. This screen here, you can see some of the functions available to you in the live event. You can change the playback speed. You can have captions and subtitles on or off if you'd like. And also, if you do suffer some video quality pro issues, you can change the level of video quality and that might help you get a better image. You can see the Q&A there um, on the right hand side. I wait where to show you uh, wh what your questions are and if they've been answered. Um, and like I said, you can also pause the event. So today I'm glad to be joined by Richard Brewster, who is the Senior Policy Manager and the Director for Healthcare and Quality Improvement. Richard's going to be monitoring the Q&A and he'll be um, theming the questions as they come in and we have time at the end to pitch the questions to the uh, presenters. Any questions we don't cover today, we don't have time for, we'll do a resource pack afterwards to make sure everyone uh, gets information related to that. We've also got Tom Gardner in the background um, uh, supporting us technically from the National VT, VC team. And we're also very grateful for Stephanie Fraser joining us in place of Jane Preston today. As you can see, we have um, some clinicians lined up for you to speak about their experience of using video and near me in neurology. Um, so we'll let those folk introduce themselves a little bit later on. So today, this is what we're going to be covering. The first part is very much designed to be scene setting with use cases, and the second half is very much around discussions and next steps. Our speakers will find you'll find they will cover common themes and also profession specific themes to their actual specialties. So what we're going to do first, I'm going to introduce uh, Stephanie Fraser to you, who is the chair of the Scottish Government Advisory Committee for Neurological Conditions, and she's going to uh, set our scene for us uh, this morning. So over to you, Stephanie. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me and see me because I've just had problems and just been thrown off the call, actually. So um, I hope that it's all working well now. Um, my name is Stephanie Fraser and I am the chair of the National Advisory Committee for Neurological Conditions. I have to apologise at the outset that I am not Dr Jenny Preston MBE, who is vice, a vice chair of the advisory committee and known, I am sure, to most of you as consultant occupational therapist and clinical need lead neurological rehabilitation with NHS Ayrshire and Aaron, who sends her apologies. And I'm sorry that I am the stand in only. Um, but my job this morning is to set the scene. The purpose of our session is to look at how we can best use video consultations. We know we've all been forced to move so much online over the last 18 months thanks to COVID, but even before then, we were looking at how we could use digital technology within practice to ensure that services could best meet the needs of people with neurological conditions. In December 2019, Scotland's first five-year plan for neurological conditions, neurological care and support 
for, in Scotland, a framework for action, it looks like this, um, was published. And in it, Commitment 8 stated very clearly, we will work to improve the use of digital technology to ensure that integrated services seamlessly meet the needs of people with neurological conditions and those who provide care and support to them. We have seen a significant rollout of near me and telephone consultations, but we at, on the committee have been very wary of arbitrary targets or being pressured to use technology just to reduce waiting lists. The National Advisory Committee have been very vocal about the need to understand the appropriate settings for digital appointments and also the importance of in-person appointments. I'm delighted that Callum Duncan is going to speak about his work and the work that we have done for the committee on working towards producing guidance on the use of technology within acute neurology settings. However, we need to ensure that the guidance is wider than just acute hospital settings. Jane Dorans and Maggie White will speak about using video consultations in their practice this morning, and hopefully in the question session at the end, we can begin to scope out this morning what you would find useful in any guidance. Before I hand over, I just want to mention the recent research um, undertaken. Sorry, I hope I haven't been dropped off the call again. Um, I want to mention the recent research undertaken by the Neurological Alliance of Scotland. It was a survey of lived experience of digital appointments. Um, they received responses from over 260 people across more than 25 different neurological conditions. Now, much of the lived experience feedback chimes with evidence we've already gathered from clinicians, but there are some important additional points, and it's extremely important that we consider these findings as any part of as part of any ongoing work to produce guidance or recommendations. The majority of the respondents, so 57% reported that they had not been able to access a face to face appointment since the pandemic began in March 2020. And nearly two thirds, 65%, had not had a video appointment. It was telephone appointments that were the most common way to access care, with 88% of respondents accessing telephone appointments during this time. Most people with neurological conditions and, and carers believe that there is a valued place for virtual appointments, for instance, where a condition is stable, for clarification of symptoms, or for general advice. However, for the majority, some face-to-face -face contact with clinicians is an essential aspect to their care. It is also important to note that a significant minority of people rejected virtual appointments altogether. Technical issues were highlighted as an issue, not only in accessing software, but sometimes people's neurological condition made it hard for them to use digital solutions. Lack of privacy, caused anxiety and stress and other issues that um, were, were, were raised were um, things like privacy and, and having to ask a carer to um, access virtual appointments for you. So the main take from the survey was um, that patients recognised there was a place for virtual appointments, but that clinicians should consider these wide range of factors when considering the best format for appointments. So that might include what the specific condition is, the stage of treatment. I mean, for example, diagnosis really should never be virtual. Um, also, how well the clinician and patient already know each other, because the ability to build up a trusting relationship is important. The ability of each individual to manage a virtual appointment physically, cognitively and technically and also the difficulties people or carers may have in speaking freely to the person or of the person they support in front of others. The need for compassionate care to enable participants to relate to each other, i.e. to pick up all those uh, difficult things, emotion, um, empathy that we all need, we all need from, from appointments. Now, I'm sure that Scottish Government and Neurological Alliance colleagues would be happy to share the findings of the lived experience survey with you, and I'm happy to feed in further in our question and answer sessions later on. But for now, it's been my pleasure 
And thank you all for your interest for attending this morning. And I will like to hand back to Mark. Thank you, Stephanie, for that. That's really good to set the scene there. And, and again, I think just to reinforce that, that blended approach and, and that choice for patients um, it, for, with each patient and, and on each occasion, looking at looking at options and choice for people. So that's that's great. Thank you so much for, for doing that. And we'll, we'll speak to you later, no doubt. So uh, next, I'm delighted to hand over to uh, Callum Duncan, consultant neurologist from NHS Grampian, and he's going to uh, tell you about his experience using video in his practice. Thank you, Callum. Um, thank you very much, Mark. Um, I hope you can all can hear me well. Um, I'm a bit of an interloper really as a neurologist, um, but I've used video conferencing um, as part of my practice covering Orkney and Shetland for more than 10 years now. So I've got quite a lot of experience with, with video conferencing. And prior to the pandemic, we were starting to use near me um, as, as a return um, slot um, thing. So I had a bit of experience before um, uh, the pandemic happened. Of course, the pandemic exploded things. So I'd like to just give you a bit of experience on using it, a bit of how much has been used in Scotland and a bit of idea about how you could potentially use near me in your practice, because we're all going to probably use it in slightly different ways. Next slide, please. So, so just a bit about teleneurology. Um, so you can use a variety of mediums and email is teleneurology, telephone is teleneurology, video conferencing is what I've been using for, for years and near me is what we're going to focus on today. Um, but this is uh, internet based um, direct PC to PC um, and works really very well and is quite flexible. Um, prior to the pandemic, very few of us were, were using video technology. I've been using it for quite a lot of years and um, doing it through video conferencing and started to use it in near me. But the pandemic really exploded things and we had to move very quickly to doing virtual consultations. Um, and you can see at the bottom, it was 330 consultations per week near me totality before the pandemic. And within eight weeks, that's gone up to 10,000. You can imagine what the infrastructure challenges around that have happened. Um, but we've gained a lot of experience in near me uh, since then. Next slide, please. So this is video conferencing. So we've got a, a dedicated room. This is in, in my department um, where I do a clinic once a week and to a room in a peripheral hospital. So this is a dedicated room in um, Orkney and you can see it's just like a standard, standard clinic room. It needs to have that dedicated room, so we couldn't use it in the pandemic. Um, it needs to have a fire and assist, which is actually quite helpful in utilising for examination. And actually you can do quite a lot. You can share images and you can do a pretty reasonable neurological examination with experience. Um, other centres do this as well, but we are probably the only centre that does a reasonable bit of examination. Obviously, the examination is dependent on the person helping you, and that can vary between people who, who do help you for this. But this is something we've used for quite a lot of years and, and had really quite good experience with. Next slide, please. So near me is much more flexible. So it can be used from any PC. Um, uh, you're better to have a double screen because you can see your documentation, you can see the patient. Um, but you're better to have double screen, but it can be used in any clinic room with um, activation with camera and mic, um, and it is just quite accessible. Um, it can be picked up from the patient um, in a smartphone, in a tablet, in a PC, and direct access in from home, but it can also be taken in from clinic rooms, GB practices, and you can use it on call. Um, so it is relatively straightforward to use. There's quite a lot of glitches, um, and that depends really on bandwidth, and we'll talk about that in a minute. There's no fire in camera control, so it limits the examination a bit. Um, and um, if you have uh, a helper, the examination is a bit easier to do, okay? We can use high-end quality cameras to improve the examination. This is the, go back to the, the, the next slide. This is the um, Neurological Alliance survey that Stephanie Fraser has talked about. Um, back to the next slide, Mark, please. Um, and you can see that across Scotland, most um, virtual consultations have been by, by telephone. And the things that came out, as Stephanie said, were 
patients would quite like to use virtual technology, but appropriately. So not uniformly, but appropriately in the right situation, and they would like it to be patient centred. Um, and I suppose the question is why there's been limited video used as it, and telephones being used more. Next slide, please. This is um, clinician experience across Scotland. So again, you can see the number of patients accessing it was mostly by telephone. And as Stephanie said, there are a, a proportion of patients who didn't actually like it and would prefer to only have face to face. But again, this is a bit predisposed because it's it's telephone consultation rather than, rather than near me. Um, clinicians um, most have preference for telephone, but again, that's probably inexperience in, it, in its use. Um, and people had a bit of worry about how good quality the clinical assessment is. But again, this is predisposed by this being mostly telephone. Importantly, people wonder whether it's going to actually speed up consultations and increase access. It doesn't, but it changes the way that you can access um, services or patients can access services. So there are quite a lot of uh, utilities that can be used. Next slide, please. So this is our Grampian experience because I already had a clinic set up using Near Me. It was straightforward for all of us to move to using Near Me, and we actually did this as default. So whereas a lot of Scotland used um, telephone, our default was Near Me, and if and if that wasn't working or the patient didn't want it, it was telephone. So actually, about eighty percent of our virtual consultations were by Near Me, and you can see at the start of the pandemic, the majority of the consultations we had were uh, by Near Me, and our clinicians who used it have a very strong preference that uh, Near Me was better because of the ability to interact with patients um, and ability to see and get non-verbal cues and do some sort of examination. The difficulties, as you can see on the side, were to do with the technical challenges, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But with experience, we sort of chose near me, and I suspect a lot of it is, is actually getting used to using the technology. And once you get used to using the technology, it is, it is easier. So what works well? You can see your patients, you can, you can see non-variable cues, it's easier to get a rapport. I certainly find it much easier if there are groups of people to interact with groups of people on a video call than I do on telephone. I find it very difficult to find the people when it's on telephone. You back, back a slide, you can notify if patient if you're running late, which you can't do that by telephone. You can undertake a limited examination. If you've got somebody um, helping you, so for example, in another clinic room, then uh, you can do a much more detailed examination. You can see patients in other hospitals and in with GP practices, and um, you can bring in other professionals. So bringing people in to the consultation, so you can have another clinician in a different hospital doing a joint consultation. You can take in relatives from across the UK. So I had somebody coming from Suffolk, some people coming in from, from North England, and that's been really very helpful when discussing things with family. And that's not something you can do if people have to travel. Um, you can bring in interpreters and you can mix your clinics into, into fairly uh, good templates. Um, the things that don't work well are the technical issues, which are mostly to do with patient bandwidth and to do with uh, the um, amount of internet traffic. And so that can be a bit glitchy and a bit, bit more difficult, but you can normally work around it. And if you choose your patients correctly, you can avoid those technical difficulties. And as Stephanie had said, it's most useful for people in neurologic practice where stable return patients or people who don't need examination. So this is the, this is the three-way multi-column. Um, so it's easiest if the patient is already there. So the patient is there, the relatives are there, and then you just add them in if you see looking down at the bottom of the screen. And that works well. Um, if uh, it can affect bandwidth sometimes. Um, so um, if it does affect bandwidth, you, you can close off the video. Um, but this can allow quite a nice sort of three-way consultation and multi-professional consultation. And you can take in one extra person or up multiple extra pressures, probably up to about nine now that you can do. So it can be really quite useful and it's secure. You can bring people in, so there's a direct way of inviting them in using text 
and using um, uh, email. Next slide, please. I think this is something that's going to be quite useful. One of the problems is pixelation, particularly on, on, on video conferencing, where if you zoom in, you get pixelation of the picture. And on low quality, you can get pixelation. But in a high quality camera on the back of the, the, the phone, this is my wife's um, iPhone, um, you can actually get really good quality pictures. You get them to flip over the picture so you can see. And I do wonder if you're thinking about home visits, this might be really quite a nice way of, of a patient or a relative taking you around their home to see what there is and how you might help with it. And um, it's also useful for close up use. I've used it to look for fasciculations on the skin, but it could also be potentially useful to look inside the mouth. So good quality pictures can be quite useful from this. Next slide, please. You can share things. So this is a scan that's been shared onto a patient's computer. It can be, it's better to be on a, a tablet or, or a PC because it's a bigger screen. You can take patients through results um, and you can share websites. So I think it's probably particularly useful for sharing resources and websites and showing patients it and taking them through it. So it can be quite useful for that. You need to make sure you don't have anything you don't want the patient to see and, and it's up on the screen. You're better with two screens because if you have one screen, you will only see the website and not the patient and you have to talk over that. And then next slide, please. And there are some technical difficulties which have, have ways around it. So if the patient can connect in, there is a way of directly connecting them in using share link by text or, or, or email. So that, that can help with that. Poor picture quality. You can switch off the, the video of other participants. You can get people to clear their browser history. But I think the best way to sort picture quality is to choose your patients correctly, um, because some patients just don't have the, the, the broadband that, that is accessible. And the consultation, if they've got good broadband, can be really excellent. And if they've got bad broadband, it can be uh, a difficult. So selection of the patient, I think, is really, really very important if you're thinking about picture quality and it'd be right for some patients and not right for other patients. It can also depend on the amount of internet traffic. Now, as we're using near me for lots of things now, the, the internet traffic has been quite heavy, but as we use it less, it might become a bit better. If there's no sound, you can supplement it by a uh, mobile telephone and just mute near me either end. And that can work really well to avoid lag and to help the sound quality and then preserve the connection. So, um, Near me is a good alternative to face to face. There are some limitations to it, but there are some things that may potentially be very useful. It needs to be person centered um, and it's most suitable in a neurological practice for returns and for people who don't need examination. But in your practice, there may be other different ways where it can be useful as an additional tool to what you do face to face and increase the scope for patients, particularly disabled patients who can't come and see you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Callum, for that. That was a really useful insight in, into your practice there, particularly around the different advantages and disadvantages to each system, um, but also, you know, that um, people, conditions preferring video over telephone and the richness that can deliver, and also you know, the person-centred, choosing the right patient, making that choice available. So thank you very much for that. I'm going to hand it over now to Jane. So um, are you ready to go, Jane? And uh, we'll, we'll let you crack on. Thank you. Um, yeah, so good morning, everybody. I hope you can all um, hear me OK. Um, my name is Jane Dorrance and I am employed as a speech and language therapist working at the Douglas Grant Rehabilitation Centre in NHS Ayrshire Naren. And um, I'm really quite excited to be able to give you a bit of an insight into some of the work that we've been doing to set up remote swallowing assessments via Near Me for patients living in the Isle of Arran. Next slide, please, Mark. Um, so this is our beautiful Isle of Arran, for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, and I have been fortunate to provide speech and language therapy input for adults in Arran who present with communication and or swallowing impairments for just around about a year now. 
and uh, whilst this is a service that I consider myself to be very fortunate to be able to provide, there are um, obvious factors that can make this a bit of a challenge. So just to give you a little bit of background into our service in Arran, so currently um, speech and language therapy services provide um, monthly visits to, um, to Arran. This obviously can vary depending on the number of referrals that we receive, which can be quite difficult to predict at times. Um, we currently have had quite a quiet spell um, of referrals from Arran, but that can be a very different picture depending on the time of year. This obviously brings about challenges in terms of the way that we are able to provide intervention um, in a timely manner. So um, I can visit Aaron one day and that on that day or the following day, we can receive referrals um, and therefore they would have to wait um, a number of weeks before we can actually um, manage to see them. Particularly for patients with swallowing um, impairment, um, that means we then have to try and, and manage them over the telephone, which is um, not always easy or possible. We're not able, always able to obtain reliable information about a patient's presentation, and that impacts on our ability to make clinical decisions. So in Arran, um, we tend to provide input to the hospital, nursing homes on a domiciliary basis, and in outpatient clinics. Alternatively, patients would have to travel to the mainland to attend outpatient appointments, and that has obvious time and financial implications for the patients and for us as well as healthcare providers. So for this reason, even prior to COVID, we had already begun to um, a pilot of near me use with patients presenting with communication impairments. Um, and at that time, using near me felt um, quite adventurous. However, we then had COVID um, and during the first lockdown, we were unable to deliver any face to face services at all. And therefore, the use of Near Me became vital to our, our whole service um, and part very much of our day to day practice. However, using Near Me to carry out swallowing assessments wasn't really something that we felt we could put in place without having robust governance and training and risk assessments. So for this reason, it was decided that we had to establish a procedure which would enable us to provide a safe and timely swallow assessment um, via a remote platform. And that was our, our priority, particularly for our patients in Arran. So oh, back to the, the previous slide, please, Mark. Thank you. Um, so our work would not have been possible without the engagement of the management and staff at Arran War Memorial Hospital and also Montrose House, who um, is the, the partnership nursing home on the island. So as I mentioned before, carrying out remote swallowing assessments has been on our, our radar um, since prior to COVID. Um, and even since 2018, we have been liaising with um, speech and language therapists in the Blackpool Teaching Hospital and NHS Foundation Trust um, and uh, Liz uh, Bowden and Veronica Southern who are managing directors of Teleswallowing. So Teleswallowing also work in collaboration with a company called Myaco who provide online um, training um, for, uh, for their Teleswallowing um, partners. So in October 2020, we had our initial meeting with Myaco, which resulted in us securing um, a free um, trial of access to their training package for the purpose of our pilot. We engaged with discussions with our speech and language therapy leads in North Ayrshire and also the AHP leads um, and um, leads in the North Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership who were very supportive of, of this pilot. We also sought agreement from digital services and procurement um, prior to delivering um, any training as well. So the training um, part of our pilot was, um, was crucial um, in ensuring that we have um, trained swallowing partners um, who will be in the room with our patients, um, helping us to facilitate that swallowing assessment. So there was two levels of training. Um, so there's the level one, 
which is a basic swallowing awareness training, which is suitable for all staff um, involved in supporting patients with their eating, drinking and swallowing. And also there is the level four training, which um, is a more in-depth knowledge required to enable trained staff to be able to become tele-swallowing practitioners. And these map onto the dysphagia competencies uh, framework. We also carried out SLT-led remote practical sessions in addition to the online training, and that enabled us just to check the technical setup and role play a typical tele-swallow session. And this was really vital to identify any issues and problem solve prior to our, our live sessions. So although as speech and language therapists, we are able to watch and direct the assessment via near me, our tele-swallowing partners very much act as our, our eyes and our hands and our ears um, to confirm what we're seeing and hearing on the screen and just to give any additional feedback. They're also responsible for preparing the clinical room and setting up equipment prior to the session. They are the person in the room with the patient, um, so they can provide reassurance and relay information to the, pa the patients. And also they are responsible for um, documenting and distributing the outcome of the assessment and any recommendations to their, their wider staff group. Although this is very much um, done under the guidance of uh, the speech and language therapists. So due to the nature of any swallow assessment, be it face to face or virtual, there is an element of risk around the potential for choking or aspiration, um, and that must be very carefully managed. Um, therefore, it was particularly paramount to evaluate and minimise the risks associated with a remote swallowing assessment. We accessed the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists telehealth dysphagia assessment material and that was hugely beneficial in terms of um, our risk management. So the decision making tool is available in two formats. There's an easy to follow flow chart, um, which can be quickly followed for each patient to determine if tele swallowing is appropriate. Um, and as has already been um, said in previous presentations, near me and tele swallow is not appropriate for, for all patients. So it is important to, to choose your patients very carefully. Um, there's also a, a dynamic electronic decision making tool that's a bit more in depth. Our teleswallow partner establishments were also asked to consider their protocols for managing risk and to ensure that they had emergency procedures in place on site, should that be required. So as well as our training and our risk assessing, there is um, technology and equipment that's obviously essential to carrying out a, um, a, a tele-swallow assessment. Um, first and foremost, you have to have a reliable internet connection um, to ensure you get adequate vis visuals and audio. If the connection is not sufficient, then that impacts on our uh, ability to make reliable decisions. Also, the staff members on our partnership had to have um, access to sufficient IT services to enable them to undertake the training. Um, and that did prove problematic in the initial stages. But we were very thankful to have had um, excellent support from the digital services team covering Aaron and also tech support from MyAco as well. So we, um, we need to have a, a device with a webcam and microphone, a mobile camera or a device with a, with a, or Mobile seating is useful to achieve different um, angles and close ups, particularly for looking in the mouth. Um, the space where the sessions take place needs to be quiet and confidential where possible um, and also close to assistance if this is required. We need access to near me um, and that's required for all our patient contacts. Um, there are certain resources that we need um, for our tele swallow sessions, um, a torch for looking in patient mouths, appropriate diet and fluid consistencies, and that's discussed at the time of telephone triage prior to our, um, our uh, tele swallow session and just other um, implements, cups and spoons and, and that sort of thing. We have our teleforma, uh, tele swallow pro forma which is our standard protocol that every tele-swallow session should follow. Although we do acknowledge that some 
um, natural variation will occur within um, within our assessments, despite having the, the pro forma. So where are we at now? Um, all the online training modules from MIACO um, at level one and level four have been completed by our, um, our nursing and care staff on the island. Um, plus, we have completed our speech and language therapy led practical training session. Um, and these were really um, the training and the practical sessions were really vital in enabling us to set up our tele swallow sessions. Also, this has afforded us an opportunity to engage with our nursing and care colleagues and work in a, a collaborative way around the general management of swallowing difficulties, which has been a huge benefit. We're now able to provide swallowing assessments in a more timely manner to enable us to manage our patients um, more safely and effectively. However, it is important to highlight that remote swallowing assessments are not intended to fully replace our face to face assessments but they are a very useful addition to what we can offer. We are currently in the process of gathering feedback from those who have completed the training, and we're also continuing to evaluate more quantitative data, such as um, cost and time efficiency, um, and also looking at the time from referral to assessment, um, just to identify our outcomes from, from that point of view. And whilst our tele swallow practitioners do have an invaluable role in our remote swallow assessments, it's really important to highlight that the duty of care for managing swallowing problems still very much remains with speech and language therapy. And any patients who present with swallowing difficulties or who we carry out an, a swallowing assessment with should continue to be referred to speech and language therapy and very much managed by the speech and language therapist. Anecdotally, our early experiences have been positive and have enabled us to manage patients who present with swallowing problems more in a more timely way. And we are very much looking forward to utilising our tele swallow sessions via Near Me as part of our routine service um, for patients in Arran and also considering how this could be used in our wider population. And um, I will hand back to Mark now, but would be um, very happy to answer any questions at the end of the session. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Jane. That, that's been um, really helpful and, and again, a really good example of an innovative approach you've used for an island community and also how you engage all those, those collaborators. So thank you very much for sharing that. It's really good stuff. So now we are going to hear from uh, Dr. Maggie White, uh, consultant psychol neuropsychologist, and um, over to you now, Maggie. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Mark. Uh, really hopeful that my Wi-Fi connection won't drop out as it did at the beginning of this meeting, but if it does, I uh, hopefully will be able to see it successfully get back in in within about five or ten seconds. So being patient. Um, so just moving on to the next slide, Mark, and I will uh, sort of what my intention is to cover today is looking at um, our experience in the neuropsychology department in NHS Grampian of the adoption of Near Me. So um, just moving on to the next, sorry, uh, including our patient acceptability and some of the points to consider. So uh, where did we start? Well, early 2020, this is our lovely department uh, sitting, having a, a meeting in a room which we have not had since and, and uh, may have again, but uh, we have our meetings very differently now. We were considering moving to near me for many of our patient contacts. There were some res reservations and resistance around that at the time. And um, I must admit, from a neuropsychology point of view, I couldn't see a way that we could deliver effective cognitive assessment via near me. But then the pandemic came along and uh, after about sort of four or six weeks uh, when we were redeployed for staff support, we were back into seeing our uh, patient group again and we were not able to see people face to face for routine care. We were able for, for emergency or for inpatients, but for routine people, then we started to adopt Near Me as our, um, as our default. 
maybe a wee bit more straightforward um, than the other professions we've heard from today, because as psychologists, quite often all we need is the screen and a, a place to, to, to see the person in terms of sometimes that can be a, a private room that we have at home or in our clinic. We didn't need a clinic setting on the other side. It's usually patients own home that we're, we're seeing them in. So being psychologists, what we wanted to do was evaluate, is this OK? Is it OK, acceptable from a clinician point of view? Is it acceptable from a patient point of view? So the next slide here shows the results of um, uh, two focus groups that we held with seven clinical neuropsychologists who'd started to use Near Me and the discussions that we had around that. I want to kind of qualify it by saying that some of this sounds a bit negative, but you put a few psychologists in a room and they start ranting about, oh, but this could be different and that could be different. But actually, um, the overall feeling was of positivity. So here's a couple of quotes from people saying um, our observation of the patient, their interaction with others in the session is absolutely key. And if we're feeling that that's a bit compromised, then it makes me feel less confident in my neuropsychological formulation and therefore my clinical judgments. And it just links into some of the themes that we've heard. There are absolutely um, a lot of situations where near me is appropriate, but we just have to be mindful of some of the situations where it may not be appropriate. And some of that can be quite subtle. Some of it is not just about, ah, if you're seeing a psychologist and, and somebody who's at a level of, of sort of mild brain injury, that's going to be OK. Whereas if it's more, if it's moderate or severe brain injury, that's not going to be OK. We cannot set those barriers like that. It's got to be on an individual basis. Uh, the other quote there, conveying empathy and, oh, move just back, sorry, uh, conveying empathy and compassion is not about what you say, it's about being around somebody and sitting with them. I don't think they can pick up your cues and that's really difficult. And when we move on to points to consider, I'll talk a little bit more about that and kind of the importance to be mindful of that when using virtual technology. So we did a sprint audit with our patients. We sent out uh, about 35 questionnaires and we, we got a response from around 20 people. We were asking people um, how satisfied they were using uh, Near Me or Attend Anywhere. And you can see here that uh, most were very satisfied and most found it easy to log in. And then on the next slide, you can see that from the list of benefits, um, people said, uh, you know, majority of people said it avoided their their uh, costs of the time travelling to and from appointment. It was easier given their health issues and their mobility difficulties to come in. Um, some people said that they were more comfortable in their own home. Some people did say that there were no benefits. Um, what were the drawbacks of using Attend Anywhere for your recent appointment? A few people found it difficult to, to log in or found that the instructions were difficult, but the majority of people found that there were no drawbacks. And then moving on to the next slide. And when we asked patients if they would recommend attend anywhere appointments to a friend or a family member, the vast majority were saying that they that they did uh, sort of, I guess that that hopefully means that they had a good experience. And what would their preference be going forward? Interestingly, a high majority said that they would actually prefer to be seen on attend anywhere going forward. And I'm wondering if some of our patients ha would have had similar kind of reservations to ourselves further back in that um, if they were given that as an option, they would probably have said no face to face like 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 usual. But once they tried because of the pandemic and um, the delivery over virtual technology, then they had found that more acceptable. So moving on to the next slide. And just to go through a few points that have been raised as we've been seeing patients on Attend Anywhere, to give you an overview, we, we mostly actually will review people in their first appointment, either for acute diagnostic cases or for people in our rehab service. Um, we'll mostly see them on Attend Anywhere for their initial appointment. And then that gives us an idea of whether actually it's a suitable medium in which to deliver the, the intervention that we need to, to do or the assessment that we need to do. Um, we have talked about patient safety a lot, and that is a little bit of a concern with us. Um, one particular example, I had a, a patient a few weeks ago who was suicidal. Um, I've not had that experience over Attend Anywhere. I've obviously had that experience face to face in my clinic, and it felt a little less comfortable being able to put that safety around that person, because if the person is with you and you feel that there is a very significant risk, then obviously you're signposting them and getting them support from psychiatry in person, but without without them going anywhere, whereas this person was on the end of technology and could have just disengaged and that would have been a, a concern for me. However, it did work 
fine and we were able to make that person safe and, and get them some uh, access to access help. So there are concerns around that confidentiality. You don't really know who's in the room at the other side. If people are disclosing things which are particularly difficult, it might be to do with family members who are in the same building as them, which is very different from them coming into a clinic room. So there are considerations there. There are considerations about the subtlety of our therapeutic relationship. It's not just about speaking to somebody who's kind of in 2D and flat screen. It's actually about those um, subtleties in your uh, your body language and, and giving people that space. But as psychologists, sometimes giving them that space, which could be a wee bit of silence, which feels very different over attend anywhere or near me as it does um, if you're actually in the room with the person. We'll talk about this it all comes down to Wi-Fi. If you don't have a good Wi-Fi connection, then delivery of remote um, therapy is very, very difficult. And also there are there are issues, I think, around the technology that people have available. If they only have a mobile phone that they can con that they can um, use, then obviously you're much smaller. Your facial expressions, the way you're engaging with the person can be more challenging. Group delivery, I know that me and me have been working hard to get that, that platform up and running and we're very, very hopeful that we'll be running a wellbeing group initially via um, near me. So we're looking forward to, to trying that out. Moving on to the next slide. Um, particularly cognitive assessment, as I said at the beginning, this was something which we would have been really quite resistant to do and we were almost forced into by the pandemic and I think that was a very good thing. So we initially had to look at the cognitive assessments and whether they were validated was, you know, what, if we were going to be assessing somebody, was that data that we were getting data that truly reflected what their difficulties were. Many tests are validated for remote delivery, but my warning is if you're going to be using a test that, that has got some validation to be very careful, you have to read the, the original articles and make sure that that validation is actually of good quality. So here, there are some of the examples where there are articles and, and uh, validation that has been done, the CVLT2 digit span, um, the R bands, the MOCA, and I'd signpost you to Brearley uh, in 2016, who's conducted a meta review across a uh, neuropsychological assessment or cognitive assessment. Visual and time tasks present more challenges than verbal tasks. Actually, verbal tasks we find pretty much straightforward. Memory list learning, uh, mental flexibility tasks where we're asking people to generate words. It's the visual and sometimes and that, the visual tasks which are difficult because you've got to give them the visual information and the time tasks because in those circumstances, um, there can be if there's a delay in, in Wi-Fi, then that, that means that the test is not valid. There are, we have got document visualizers and we have been using them, but what you have to be very careful if you're sharing something visually over um, near me, then you have to make sure that the copyright is OK. So Pearson's as a test company actually don't allow any of their tests to be used visually via remote technology. So there are ways, but it is a bit more complicated. And we, you have to have an awareness of all the factors that normally impact cognitive assessment, which might be accentuated by doing that virtually. So anxiety, communication, processing speed, fatigue, those are all factors to consider. So next slide. Um, just a few practical considerations uh, from using near me. Absolutely always take a note of the telephone number of the person because if the, if the connection drops and they're gone, you're scrabbling about. I do a, a very kind of a brief similar intro to, to each patient on what to do if the Wi-Fi drops, which basically is I will, you know, I will try and get you back. It may take a few seconds, but if I don't get you back, I will phone, uh, I will give you a phone. So I always have the telephone number of the patient there. Increasing reflective feedback, I think, is really important. So um, it can look if you're listening to somebody intently, you could be listening, kind of still watching. But actually, if you move a bit more, it shows people that you're still there and that the screen hasn't frozen. And it also from a communication point of view, I think it's very important that people feel that they, they're being heard, which can be more challenging over over virtual consultation. Um, reassuring the patient that the assessment and the intervention is effectively delivered with others. That's been really helpful for us when we're talking about patient choice and deciding whether we need to see the person face to face. We can talk about other patients as in, say, there are other patients, obviously not giving any details of other patients, but there are other patients that we have worked through therapeutically and we found that this has been effective. So in, in sort of encouraging people to say that that is um, usual care. 
and to keep that dialogue open open regarding their view on the interaction. So I think a flexible use of near me and the option of face to face has been really important with patients, not just this is the default and this is how you're going to be seen, but if they really need to be seen face to face, then then um, that's a, a dialogue and a choice that you have with the patient. And it's continually considering what is best for that individual in that circumstance. So next slide, please, Mark. And just as final points, um, each case is definitely individual and the patient needs to remain central in this. So one fit doesn't necessarily fit all and that can be for lots of different reasons. It's not just about the intervention. It could be personal differences with the patient. It could be abilities with the patient. And I think that clinical judgment in this should take priority and should be built into any guidance that, that we have. Um, just being aware of discrimination based on access to technology. So for people who may not be able to afford the right technology, then they may, may not have the option to be able to use near me. Um, people's ability or confidence in using that. Um, and also uh, their obviously technology and their, their Wi-Fi signal. And I think the, the sort of final thing to say is I think we should be prepared to try in any way the delivery of care in different virtual ways, because um, as we've sort of discussed today with Jane and with um, Callum and with our experience of cognitive assessment, I actually wouldn't have thought that those things were possible until you actually then have a look at them and, and give it a try. So I think we really should be able to, to try as long as safety and equality and care is not compromised for the patients. And then the final slide, very final slide. So this is kind of where we are at now. This is actually our Christmas party. I wanted to get our Teams meeting, which is now uh, done on Teams, but we are very much living in a, a blended virtual and face-to-face -face world in neuropsychology at the moment. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, thank you, Maggie, that, that was really, insightful and I think the key uh, this here you go from you know I can't see how we do that to yes we can it was really good to, to listen to and to to get your honest opinion on how that work was and that that whole you know take it case by case what's going to work for that patient on that day so um what I'd like to do now is is uh, hand over to uh, Richard and also my colleague uh, Rosie Cooper who's a uh, quality improvement lead within uh, near me and we'd very much like to um just open up some discussion, um, use the chat function, you know, what kind of things uh, would the guidance need to contain for it to be helpful? We're looking for volunteers to, uh, you know, get to look at developing guidance and test it, and, and what's the next steps for people in practice in, in neurology? So um, I'm gonna just pass over to, to Richard now, and we'll see whether we get any questions coming through the chat. We'd be really grateful and keen to hear from you as our audience today. Yeah, there's there's nothing come through in the chat uh, yet. Um, so if, if um, I, I, I don't know if, if if people that are um, attending can um, uh, bring verbal questions to the table. I don't know if that's possible, Mark. Um, uh, no, attendees can't can't join in to speak. So so right. it's, it's chat only. Um, yeah. Has anybody got any comments or experiences of using near me in practice they'd like to share or? Um, I mean, if you want to take a, we do have a, um, a survey at the end of the, of the session today asking people's thoughts and ideas around the guidance and whether they'd be happy to be involved. But if there are people that would like to kick off a discussion around, um, you know, how they see near me and video consultation being used in um, neurology. So um, Maggie's um, put in there, I, I wonder if uh, many of the attendees are actively using near me, what their experience is um, and, and any barriers.
or positives indeed, Maggie. If I maybe go back to when we started using the ME, and if you look at the difference in use over Scotland and the difference perhaps in, in Grampian, I think sometimes you just have to start using it. I think both Maggie and I have seen that you know, when you start using it, you can see the, the advantages and utility of it. And I think it has to be to supplement what you do normally. Um, so you, when you start using it, you you, you realise it, it is it is useful and there are things that you can do with it. Um, but it's, it's it's like getting over a step to actually start using it. it can sometimes be a bit of a barrier. Um, and was the advantage we had in Grampian was that we already had these things set up. And so it was fairly easy to transfer it over to Nimi, where, whereas where it wasn't set up, um, it required that next step to happen. Another issue which occurs to me actually is around availability of technology um, for people. I mean, we were very lucky in that, that very quickly we were able to get a laptop for everyone who was delivering near me. However, that might not be the case across boards or across different specialities. So I think that that's something which is, is definitely a consideration. I had just put in the chat that our experience at Cerebral Palsy Scotland as a third sector service um, deliverer is very similar to as, as Maggie described it. Um, and I love your tip about have a have a backup if what to do if the Wi-Fi drops. Um, because I and, and actually to move on the screen so that you're not sitting there thinking, has the Wi-Fi dropped? Um, which is slightly how I'm feeling this morning. <laughs> but um, I think there's some really good tips there that I will be s telling our therapists about. But I wonder how, you know, the other thing we found useful for is to bring in other partners uh, to, into, you know, it's been easier to talk to social work, for example. So J Jenny's just uh, coming in the chat. Lovely to hear from you, Jenny, saying uh, sorry she can't be with us today. And thank you, Stephanie, for covering and doing such an amazing job. Um, can uh, can I ask the audience if they would find guidance helpful for their practice? So it'd be interesting to hear from people on that, if possible. And also from John Higgin, uh, it works well for me for clinical uh, interviewing. Um, I was quite sceptical to, to begin with but uh, it is not so good for administration of tests, which is a big part of uh, my work. And Mark's put in the um, in the chat um, uh, asking people to complete the, the post webinar survey. I think on the question of guidance, because um, this, this is HP and, and neuropsychology kind of uh, joint today, um, neuropsychology did bring out guidance from the Division of Neuropsychology um, quite early on, uh, around I think about August 2020 or maybe Ju July 2020, and the heads of psychology services have general guidance which covers clinical psychology, including neuropsychology. So we, we do have some of that. It's not absolutely specifically near me. It covers all virtual consultation, but it might be something that we work with the Neurological Alliance around. Although I'm wondering if that's a bit different from HP guidance for which there's a number of different um, uh, ways that, that care is being delivered. I think my experience with with guidance and um, as a as a profession, um, we do have guidance from our professional body, the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists. But there is also board, NHS board based guidance and um, guidance from within our own team as well. So I think there is quite a lot of, of guidance out there and maybe just kind of pulling it together a, a bit more, a bit concisely so that it's all in the one place. Um, for kind of neural patients um, would be would be beneficial. OK, I think what we'll do, it's it is now 12 o'clock, so I, I'm, I suppose what I'd like to do is just is just to wrap up really and, and just thank everyone for for um, sharing their innovations, their 
their positives, their, their challenges and how they overcome those. Uh, and, and thank you to everybody who, who's, who's joined us there. There's been about 36 folk today that have, that have joined us for our session. So hopefully out of that, that group will be able to um, take the next steps with, with Richard and the team in terms of gathering guidance to support you as professionals uh, meeting your patient's needs within the neurological um, uh, patient group. So again, another plea to fill in the, the survey, so we ask you about your experience today, but also ask you if you would like to engage with the advisory committee around putting together guidance and testing that out. So again, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we'll be recording the session and we'll put out some resources alongside. And thank you very much to our speakers uh, who have uh, shared their expertise and their experiences today. And we'll look forward to seeing you at another one of our webinars sometime in the future. Thank you very much.